Amen. Well, good morning, Pillar. Uh, Pastor Canaan here. Go ahead and open in your copy of God's Word to Psalm 103. We're going to consider just the first few verses of Psalm 103 this morning. And this morning, and as you can see, as we go through the Psalms, um, I'm not interested in, in highfalutin theology these last few sermons. And this sermon is like that, too. I'm not interested in the highfalutin theology today, though we do get into that and we'll get into that. I want something that's going to stick to your ribs. And so we're going to consider this psalm, and there's just a real simple truth and refrain that we're going to glean from it. While you're turning there, um, you know, I'm, I'm remembering my past, and I remember some of the cultural proverbs that we grew up with, and every culture has proverbs. They have sayings that they heard growing up, and you know when you was a kid, you didn't know what your parents were talking about? And then as you grew up, you start saying them same things. And some of y'all still don't know what, the, what them things mean. I remember I just figured out what this mean. You know, I grew up hearing all that, all that glitters ain't gold, baby. And I used to look at my grandma and be like, what you talking about? Like, what are we talking about glitter for? Like, I got you know, gold glitter? Uh, one of them, I didn't know what it meant, but I knew, I knew what it meant for me. You know, a hard head make a soft behind. Yeah, y'all heard that. Some of y'all heard that. You're like, ooh, flashback. That mug is real. And then growing up in my house, there was a cultural saying that confused me, but I knew exactly what it meant. It was, I wish you would. <laughs> right? And you don't know what to do because you're like, you're telling me to do what I'm not supposed to be doing. And if I do it, you're going to be mad if I do it. But I knew what it meant. Don't do it. Even if she said do it. And it you, there's, a, there's like cultural proverbs and stuff. And so uh, we had those cultural proverbs, but then I was shocked to realize that we also had cultural curses. And y'all have had co- one of the curses in my, my family growing up is if you put a hat on a bed, my grandmother would straight upside the head with you because she's like, you p- can't put a hat on a bed. That's bad luck. And so I was like, I always, always taking my hat. Or did that happen? Oh, you can't put a hat on a bed. I never believed in any of the cultural curses until I was victim to one of them. It was a Saturday morning. My wife went to work. She does that every couple Saturdays. And the kids woke up and they was bugging. They were screaming and crying from Jump Street. They were bickering and whining. They were fighting amongst each other. (laughs) Tears are flowing early in the morning. They're making a mess everywhere. Every 40 seconds, they're calling my name. You know, the first one comes in. I get her calmed down. As soon as she leaves, here come the, the, the rotating door. Second one comes. She leaves. I got her calm down. She leaves. Here come the baby. And then she gets out. And then I can count T minus 40 seconds. And it starts again. And then, and then I ask them to wash their body. And it's like I ask them to paint the garage. Uh, can, y- can y'all go take a shower? Oh. And I was already mad. I'm frustrated. So I'm just like, okay. Woo. I needed to breathe. And so I went to the one place that every man goes to when they need peace and comfort and love. I went to the bathroom. <laughs> In these modern days, a man needs to do what a man needs to do. And I opened up my phone, put on IG, put the headphones in, let them scream, and I started scrolling. And I saw a couple of memes. And if anybody knows me, I'm a meme head. I'm a meme man. I saw one is this. Having kids make you realize how dumb your lies used to sound when you <laughs> to your parents. <laughs> Right. So I kind of giggled like, yes, yes. OK, this is OK. And then I saw this one and this one. This is when, when it hit me that I was a victim of the curse. Parenting hack. There are no hacks. Everything is hard. These kids don't listen. This is your life now. Godspeed. <laughs> At that moment, I realized I was a victim of the curse. Y'all know what curse I'm talking about? The curse when your mama come up on you and she says, When you grow up, I hope you have kids just like you. And I realized, and I was like, it's real. Oh, my. I know some of y'all are thinking, like, okay, Pastor King, where are you going with all this? This is where I'm going. I think that one of the greatest dangers of our lives is forgetfulness. I think that forgetfulness is one of the greatest tools in the toolbox of Satan to cause you to forget. Because when you forget, 
you lose perspective. When you lose perspective, you lose efficacy in your home and around and with the people around you. And Satan wants you to be an ineffective witness to your children, to your friends, to your family, to your loved ones. He wants you to forget where you've come from. And isn't this funny? This is a tactic that we've seen. This is what was used against the slaves during the transatlantic times. If I can make you forget where you came from, I can own your mind. And it only takes, then it takes one generation. For us, it takes five minutes to forget. Forgetting where you come from stops you from appreciating where you are now. Forgetting the grace and mercy that you've received from God or from others tends to make you, listen, when you forget the grace and mercy that you've received from God or others, it makes you stingy with the grace. I had a, I was talking with somebody um, recently, a couple people, and I, and I was mentioning how you can always tell when somebody remembers that they're a recipient of mercy, when somebody has fallen in sin around them, because your response to them is a telltale. That harsh, like, ah, you should have known. And it's like, whoa, you've never received grace and mercy. You've never done anything. Yeah. It's funny. We want mercy when it's us, but when it's others. And it makes us stingy with the grace. Forgetting what God has done for you over the course of your life can lead you to pride, arrogance, bitterness, and hopelessness. Beloved, the key thing I want you to pull away from this is the art of remembering. Don't let Satan cause you to forget. You ever have that moment when you were growing up, you were around your nieces, your nephews, your kids, and you were watching them do something, and then you realize that you used to do those same things, and so you were almost compelled to call your parents and be like, mom, dad, uncle, auntie, grandma, grandpa, I'm sorry, man, I was a, I was a brat. I was the worst. Like, you ever have that realization moment? Yeah. My prayer this morning is that we have that moment with the Lord Jesus, that we can mature enough, remember enough, that we're willing to get on our knees, go to the Lord in prayer. I'm like, Lord, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm realizing something. I'm not what I think I am, but I know I need you. Thank you for putting up with me for so long. Thank you for putting up with my mess. I know I'm a mess, but I need you. Let's look at the Psalm, Psalm 103. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, My soul bless the Lord. All that is within me, bless his holy name. The psalmist starts off with a command. This is a command in the scriptures. He's commanding himself to do something. He's commanding his soul to bless the Lord. Now, why would anybody have to command themselves to bless the Lord? Because we, like children, when we're in our feelings, demand a certain level of circumstances in order for God to merit our blessings of him. And that's true for me. That's true for you. That word bless means to uh, praise or to kneel in honor. Is blessing the Lord a regular habit for you? And just be honest with yourself. You don't say anything, but is it regular? If it's not, Beloved, you fall victim to forgetting. For some of us, we don't, we, we don't bless the Lord because we're mad at God right now. Some of y'all, that's true. You're just in a place of being angry with God. Okay, it's okay. You can say that. You can admit that. Some of y'all don't bless the Lord because, as I said earlier, you're looking for the perfect set of circumstances in order for him to engender your blessings. Well, if this isn't going right, I'm not doing it. Or I don't feel like blessing the Lord right now. And so we. <clears throat> Some of y'all don't have a regular habit of blessing the Lord. Because you have a real hard past. And you're wondering why God would allow you to endure the real hardness that you endured. And so you have this until he comes to me and 
begs for my forgiveness, I will not give my blessings to him. These are things that we would never say with our mouths, but our heart and our actions bear the fruit of it. Because a blessing is not a regular reality for you. What is it that's causing you, stopping you, keeping you from giving God what's due him? Beloved, the psalmist is commanding himself to bless the Lord because this is not an option. It's mandatory. This isn't a feelings based proposition. It's a position based requirement. And God is telling us to play our position. And the psalmist recognizing within himself that he needs to play his position. You are God. I'm created by you, run by you, sustained by you. You give me all things good. How who am I to not give you what's yours? You don't ask your children to respect you, do you? No, you train them to respect you. you they, they respect you through observance. They respect you through what's taught of them. You don't allow your children to respond to you based on how they feel, do you? You can't you let your kids talk to you any kind of way? Well, I'm mad right now, so blickety blank, blank, blank. That old proverb come out, I wish you would. <laughs> it's funny. It makes sense when we talk about parenting and children, but with God, we feel justified. In my house, my children don't have to like my rules, but they have to, have, they have, but they have to respect my decisions. They have to play their position and remember who they are. In my house, there was a cultural proverb that said, you better recognize who paid the bills up in this month. And that's what the psalmist is saying within his own soul. Soul, recognize. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. It's not a feelings-based thing. It's a he's worthy of my praise type of thing. And his worthiness is not determined by what you feel. But we think it does in the day to day. So if you don't feel like it, you don't do it. You don't do it. You feel justified in not doing it or you feel this much guilt. And over time, the guilt goes away. The psalmist is telling his soul, recognize. And then he says this. He says, oh, I can point this out here. I'm trying to. All that is within me. Just as a side note, if you ever read the book of Malachi, at the end of the book of Malachi, God is getting at the people of Israel for giving him the sacrificed animals that were maimed, wounded, or otherwise dismembered. They were missing a leg. Maybe they were blind in one eye. And what they would do is say, here, God, we're going to give you the wounded, maimed, one-legged animals so that we can keep the healthy, good-looking animals, sell them, make a profit, and live. So, God, we're going to give you this trash that we we're going to blend up anyway, and we're going to keep the good stuff for ourselves because we got to eat, right? Not understanding where their joy, their happiness, and the sustenance of their life comes from. And then we go and do the same thing. We give God the very last 10 seconds of our night. Oh, Lord, thank you. Good night. Thank you for this food. First time you talk to him all day. And it's dinner. Something's conditioned us. Something happened to us. We don't forgot. We've become a forgetful people. Then look, 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 look what the psalmist says. In verse 2, he says, My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. It's amazing, and I confess this, it's amazing to me the level of disrespect to God that I give to him, how I'm quick to remember the things that God doesn't give me that I wanted, but I'm easy to forget the, all the great things that he did give me that I never asked him for. I'm a forgetful man. This is why I'm a big fan of, of journaling. And I encourage you, maybe pick up the habit of journaling and writing down what God did for you that day. And then maybe visit that journal six months, 12 months out and Actively remember what God did for you so that praises flow freely from your lips. This is why Israel is told over and over again throughout the scriptures to remember who God is, who they are and what God has done for them. This is this is one such occasion in Deuteronomy six. He, now, this is God getting ready to do something for them. And then he tells them, don't forget. Why is he telling them not to forget? Because we some forgetful somebodies. 
He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you a land that's large, beautiful cities that you, don't, that you, did, not, uh, that you did not build. Houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with. Cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. We eat and are satisfied, and yet we're, we're told at that point to be careful not to forget. These are all the good things that will happen to them. And at the end of the list of good things, he says, don't forget. Why? Because we're, we're conditioned-based people. We come to God when we need something like a genie in a bottle. Lord, get me out of this situation. Right, be rubbing that lamp hard. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, I ain't sleeping at night, rubbing that lamp. Lord, fix this ailment within me, rubbing that lamp. Soon as everything is peachy keen, where's God? You don't rub the lamp just to say, what's up, what you eating tonight? You ain't just fellowshipping with him, what, what is it? It's we've forgotten, we're an unappreciative people because we've forgotten who God is, who we are, and what he has done for us. There are some, some of us, beloved, some of our family members who have systemic sicknesses Right. They have a, a, an issue, imbalance in their body somehow, and they need a medication in order to remedy the imbalance. And so what do we do? And this is like my stubborn older family members. They take the medicine. They start to feel better. And then what do they do? They stop taking the medicine. And, you, and, and it's funny because us, we're sitting there looking like, what are you doing? The medicine's what makes you feel better. The imbalance hasn't been dealt with. You need the medicine. Why well, feel good? Throw the medicine away. What happens 10 minutes later? They back to filling the trash that they was feeling. <coughs> Not remembering, not understanding, not comprehending. It was the medicine that's making me feel good in the first place, giving me the strength to deal with, this, with the issue that I had. And we forget and we do the same thing with God on a regular basis. When you're in trouble, I bet you you pray. When you're hurting, you're struggling, you're in need of something, you pray. Maybe you don't endure in prayer. Maybe you don't tarry in prayer, but you do do it. But when everything is great, do you? I'm guilty of not doing it. We should, like the psalmist, command our soul to praise God and to actively remember his benefits. And if you can't think of one benefit that God has granted to you, this is the point in which you need to turn your eyes to the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is no greater benefit, period, than the person of work of Christ for you. Look what the psalmist says. This is verse 3. You see how the psalmist gets... Remember, the whole scriptures point you to Christ. This is Psalms. This is hundreds of years before Jesus. Even all of a sudden, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Why? What's the first thing he says? He forgives all your iniquity. And he heals all your diseases. My past, your past, our past are full of wretched things, are they not? Remember when the, there was a woman in the scriptures in John, a woman that was caught in adultery in Jesus and the, 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 the religious leaders drug her to the middle of the place where Jesus was, was there and teaching. And then they told him this woman was caught in adultery. And then, you know, remember, remember, remember what they said? She was caught in adultery. We got to handle this situation. And Jesus was like, yep, we do. He didn't say we don't. He said, yeah, that's right. Whoever's without sin, cast that first stone. Get the party started. But she wasn't stoned. Why? Because everyone was full of sin. And the scripture says, one by one, they began to leave that place. And then he looked at her and said, are you alone? Are you the only one here? Just me and you? He said, I don't condemn you either. Now, what's crazy is that Jesus is the one with the authority to start the party in that situation. And he chose to be a dispenser of mercy and grace. He chose to forgive her iniquities, her pains, her heartaches. She was caught red-handed in sin. And yet God said, no, beloved, mercy and grace is what I will give you today. And then he says, sin no more, but mercy is yours. I don't know about y'all, but I, got, I have a wretched past. I've done some really bad things in my life, both before I was a Christian, as a Christian, yesterday. You have too. Y'all know that movie, The Truman Show? Or Ed TV? 
you'd all be in jail. If we could see what was going on, floating around in your head, all of us be locked up. Yet the scripture tells us to bless the Lord, to praise him, if for nothing else than for this reality right here, that he forgives all our iniquity and he heals all our diseases. Forgiveness of your sins can be yours. Every indiscretion, every evil thought, every haughty look, every act of anger, every act of lust can be forgiven. Every speck of dirt in your heart, every skeleton in your closet can be forgiven. Every sin of omission, every sin of commission, once repented to him, can be forgiven. You don't have to live in fear of what sin would do to you. If the Lord says, I have the power to forgive. Forgiven by the mercy of God, healed by grace through faith. This is what I want to point us to. Don't get so forgetful that your praise of God is circumstantial. Whatever happened is simply delighting in your salvation. You read in books of old, it'll say, Lord, if you do nothing else for me, you redeemed my soul. We don't say that anymore because we don't really want that. In fact, I think silently in our heart, we want everything else. And we say, Lord, you keep the redemption. That's a scary proposition. We've forgotten the person and work of Jesus. A God who didn't leave us to our own devices, but he entered into his own creation. After that creation had disrespected and spat upon his name, he decided within his own holy mind to enter into that creation and to give his life to shed his blood so that the sins of that very sinful people would be forgiven. This is what it says of the law. It says, according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But now, he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Your sin, your mercy, I mean, sorry, your sin is paid for by the blood of the Savior. That's how it gets paid for. That's how it gets dealt with. That's the celebratory reality. That Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Scriptures prophesy about him, and this comes true 700 uh, years later. He says he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. This is the work of Jesus for you, beloved. Beloved. That if you would but remember what Jesus has done for the redemption of your soul, maybe something within you will, will, will kindle a word of praise. But so long as you allow the world, the culture, and everything else to blind your mind, to cloud your, your thinking, you'll never utter the praise that is due his name. We're going to keep going real quick. Psalm 103, verse 4. It says he, re- he, he redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. Sorry. That mug is true. Some of y'all don't believe in the pit. And so there's no praise from your lips because you think that there's nothing for him to save you from. I want you to recognize something, beloved. It's, it's burning me up. I'm sorry. You are broken and sinful. You are people in need of forgiveness from a holy God who will not ignore your sin. He he knows you. He sees everything you've done, everything you do. And he's loving and he's kind and he's beckoning you. Come by faith. Believe on me. I will wipe you clean. But for some reason, we just go about our day like it's nothing. No more of that, beloved. You cannot do that. Reckon with the reality of your sinful condition. I'm broken. I need help. I need a savior. Because my end is the pit. My end is eternal separation. My end is damnation. My end is no blessed for me, no heaven for me. Doesn't matter what the preacher say at your funeral. He can't preach you there. 
you get there by grace through faith in his name. You cannot leave here forgetting anymore. You can't. Don't. Please don't. Don't forget what Jesus has done for you. If you have no other reason to praise his name, remember the redemption of your soul by the blood of the lamb. You may have no other reason, no other earthly reason to praise his name, but that truth never goes away. And he's still worthy of your praise despite your circumstances today. I know y'all hurt and I know y'all broken. I know y'all need a hug. I know you're struggling. I know that there's tensions and issues. I know you're lonely. I know you're beefing with your spouse. I know your kids are running amok. I know the people at school making work making fun of you. I know the boss is treating you unfairly. I know that I know you want to cry. You're on the bride. No, that truth is where you lean now. The circumstance is always going to come around. It's a full circle. Things are great. Things are horrible. Things are great. Things are horrible. That did not dictate or determine your praise from your lips. But Satan got us bugging. Your flesh got you forgetting. Can, if we do anything from here. I don't just scrapped half this. I don't even know how, where I'm at. If you do anything from here, get in the car and take a moment to actively remember what Jesus has done. Repent of your forgetful soul and command yourself because of who you are and who he is to give him what's his. And don't put your foot on the gas pedal till you do. Because God is not pleased with our ignoring of his person and work. He rescued me from the pit and he rescued you from the pit. And then he crowns us with faithful love. Beloved, do you, do you deserve that? I don't. I done just told y'all I have a wretched past. I have a wretched 37 years of life. But there's this silver lining of grace running through it. The kindness of God that I did not earn nor deserve. And it's funny, if you've ever been a recipient of faithful love, then you know what I'm about. It changes you. You're not the same after receiving faithful love and grace. It's like when you do some dirt and the person you did against forgives you. And then you're like, you can't even believe it yourself. It just, it alters you. You're changed forever. And it's weird. It's hard to accept because some of us have lived a life of conditional love where we had to earn the hug. We had to earn the, the, the love from somebody else. If I didn't perform, they didn't, or at least, it, at least it didn't look like, they loved me anymore. We do this with kids all the time. We do this with our friends all the time. And so when God offers this faithful Love that's based on his, the work of his son and by faith and entrusting, him, entrusting of his name. It's like this foreign object that we don't even know what to do with. But he crowns us with it. He puts it on our heads. He says, child, this is what this looked like. Beloved, royalty, beautiful, love, you're my princess. I know what you did. You're still mine. Come here. Crowns us with love and compassion. And once we receive this love and compassion, it transforms the way we interact with other individuals. Compassion is the language of God. It has to become our language with one another. Compassion is the consideration of someone's circumstance, the love in which you will show them and the, um, and the, and the degree in which you feel their circumstance and situation and love them through. Not ignoring it, not turning your head to it, but to the degree that you can. Then the scripture tells us this. It gives us this beautiful word. Satisfied. Once we do business with God, once we've repented, ter- confessed our sin, repented our sins to him, we don't to him. He satisfies us with good things. Your youth is renewed like an eagle. It's almost like your legs are spry again when you've been forgiven something. 
The text says that he satisfies us. It's like we have a new lease on life. We're satisfied with the sustenance of eternal salvation. We're not temporarily satiated by the cotton candy of people's approval. We're satisfied with his divine touch and compassion. We're not plagued with the heartburn of prideful scorn from others who have yet to receive grace. We're satisfied with his crown of faithful love. We're not burned by the heat of a performance-based love. Beloved, your opportunity and my opportunity to command our soul to praise God is now. It is not tomorrow. I, 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 I wish I could promise that you're going to leave here safe. I don't know what's about to happen once, once we say amen. But you can praise him now. You can remember his person and work now. You can look at your life and say, you know what, Lord, you have given me good things. Every one of you have shoes on your feet. All of you do. You got pants on. Y'all look, y'all some good looking people. Praise God. Bless your holy name. I made it. I'm broke. I'm hurt. I'm on the brink of crying, but I done made it. And then look around. There's a sea of people who will pray for you and love you and care about you to whatever degree they can. It's here. Why do we? We don't forgot. Came in broken, leave broken. No, leave prayed for. Leave with the hope of restoration. Don't leave here the same as you came in, a forgetful somebody. Leave here remembering who you are, who God has surrounded you with, who he is and what he has done and what he can continue to do for you. And if you don't have a reason to praise his name, turn your eyes to the person of Jesus and praise his name for the redemption of your soul through the blood of his son. And let his faithful love and compassion crown you. Remember, just remember. Remember.